Health Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Yelland. The question we're asking ourselves here at Cannabis Health Radio is, do we continue doing this or do we shut it down? That's the dilemma we're facing over the next several weeks. The future of Cannabis Health Radio rests with you, the listener. If we can get enough listeners making donations, we can survive. If not, then Corey and I will reluctantly and sadly be forced to shut down this podcast. As mentioned before, we've made a substantial financial investment in equipment, website, and our time with only a sparse return. Corey and I do this because we love bringing these inspirational stories to you. Stories of people who successfully used cannabis to clear a fatal disease or used it to ameliorate the pain of an ailment they have. With governments around the world slowly legalizing medical marijuana, more and more people are looking at this plant for their health. We view our podcast as an educational tool for them to learn what others have done. But we can't do it without your help. Some donations have trickled in, but certainly not enough to sustain us. Our urgent plea is for listeners to go to our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and make a pledge, either a one-time donation or a monthly contribution. We can't continue on this journey without your help. So make a contribution today. Our guest today has dealt with the psychological stress and tragedy of cancer in her family, dealing with her husband's cancer, her mother's, and her own breast cancer. Here to tell us her story is Jerry Klugart of Chimenez, British Columbia. Jerry, thanks very much for joining us. Greatly appreciate it. Hi, Ian and Corey. I'm really happy to be here. Hi. Jerry, take us back to 2012 and tell us about your husband's cancer. Well, um, what happened in in 2012, that was basically the beginning of my my journey with cancer. And it started off with a bang um, because I'd sent my husband to the doctor. He didn't like to go to the doctor, um, but he'd been experiencing really bad heartburn. So... Um, what happened was he ended up going for an ultrasound and uh, eventually we discovered that he was carrying a very large retroperitoneal sarcoma tumor in his abdomen. It actually filled up his entire abdomen. And uh, he had surgery for that in June, June of 2012. And uh, it ended up being about 22 pounds. Wow, a 22-pound tumor. It was enormous, absolutely enormous. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, he also, the, one of his kidneys had been encased. He had his kidney, his adrenal gland removed, his spleen, part of his bowel, and, of course, the tumor. So that was a very traumatic experience for all of us. We didn't even know if he would survive the surgery. Well, that's a pretty but, massive surgery. It was, it was, and, you know, we really didn't know. He had been overweight, um, but then he had lost weight, and everything got smaller except for his stomach, of course. You know, after the surgery, he was quite a, quite a bit different. Yeah, I was going to ask you what his appearance was like after he had the tumor removed. You know, it, um, the whole process was was really life-changing in in many ways. Um, He aged dramatically after that. Um, His whole appearance actually changed. He didn't have chemo or radiation because neither of those treatments, it was well known that they didn't work with a sarcoma. Um, Most cancers are carcinomas, and uh, the sarcoma doesn't respond to chemo or, or radiation. But I'm not a fan of chemo or radiation under any circumstance. But at that time, I didn't, I wasn't as knowledgeable as I am now um, about those treatments. But he, um, he ended up having another three and a half years. He, um, he didn't go back for his regular scans. He, he refused to do that for a few years. It also placed a tremendous amount of stress on our relationship. So. Um, we, we had some difficulty after that. We had a couple of separations, but we did reunite in the fall of, of 2015. Jerry, do you think he had, uh, uh, I don't want to say a death wish, but do you think he knew that he was dying? I think so. I think he knew his days were limited, and I don't think he wanted to go through another one of those surgeries. 
he i've been really disciplined in in being able to to do the, the right things for my health my husband gord he loved his chocolate bars and he drank his milk every day and he loved his meat and potatoes you know the standard north american diet and um he 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 also didn't like the cannabis oil we tried the cannabis oil um but he really didn't didn't like how that made him feel so he basically refused to take it so his options weren't as as good as mine so he didn't like he didn't like getting high is that it no he didn't he well he didn't mind smoking it but eating eating the cannabis oil has different effects for different people and he really mm-hmm. didn't like the way feel he just refused to take it he said i i can't i can't eat it it makes me feel too um too anxious well that's too bad because you know um there's a couple of things you can do about the anxiety yes and we didn't know that then mm-hmm. i've learned about some of that now my mom also had the same experience with the oil but she stuck it out for three months well, good for her. So tell me about your husband's uh, final days. What uh, what transpired? You see, that's jumping ahead. It hasn't even been a year since he he passed. He passed last January 27th. Mm-hmm. And um, because he had seen the difficulty I'd gone through with my mom, who was diagnosed in November of 2014, um, and I had been her caregiver. I had also taken care of my husband. And, um, and then I was diagnosed with cancer a month before my mom passed away in September of, of uh, 2015. And um, he'd always said to me, if I ever get a terminal illness, I'm going to decide how I'm going out. I'll probably go and get some kind of drug. You know, he talked about heroin, actually. And he said, I, I'm not going to stick around and, and, and have people watch me um, suffer and, and have them suffer doing that. What happened was we both went for scans in December of 2015. I'd already been diagnosed, and he decided he was going to have a look and see what was going on because he'd been having some pain. And December the 8th, our scans um, determined that my little tumor had gotten smaller, but he was now had three tumors. One was in each site where he'd had an organ removed. There was one where the spleen was, one where the kidney was, and there was one in his, his groin. And uh, the doctors wouldn't meet with us until after Christmas. And I'd already been to the cancer clinic, and I'd seen the chemotherapist, and I'd seen the radiologist, and I'd talked to the surgeons, and they weren't very happy with me because I was refusing all of their treatment. And we have a very kind of unique last name, Kluhart, which isn't that common. So when my husband came around, I don't know if they decided to to um, just let us sit with it for a while or what, but we didn't find out until early January that it was inoperable. And actually, it was the receptionist told us on the phone. We didn't even get to see the surgeon. So it was a few days after that, my husband decided that he was going to, we were going to go to the doctor, and um, he was taking morphine for his pain. And he confided in me that it wasn't going to take long, and he didn't want to prolong anything, and, and that he would um, he would just take as much morphine as he could. It actually took about nine days, and uh, he ended up having a heart attack. Mm. <clears throat> Boy, you've had some stress in your life, haven't you? Well, yeah, it's been a pretty rough year. <laughs> yeah. So your husband dies, and your mother previously was diagnosed with lung cancer. Yes. Uh, tell us, but tell no, us her, sorry? That's correct. She was diagnosed before my husband died. Okay. Tell and us, she passed away before my husband did. Okay. Tell us her story. Okay. Well, my mom, you know, my mom is, was a, a wonderful, wonderful person. She was very, you know, conventional, and she certainly didn't think of cannabis as being something that she wanted to take. So she she really did believe all of propaganda that we've all been taught about cannabis being bad and not something that we should we should partake of. Um, so it took a little bit of convincing, but she did agree to try it. 
What was amazing, what was absolutely amazing to me was about a month after my mom had been taking the cannabis, quite honestly, she looked better than she'd looked in 10 or 20 years. And I was spending a lot of time with her and everywhere we went, you know, people would say, well, hello, how are you, Muriel? And and she'd say, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with lung cancer. And they would say, well, you know, you sure look good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because she really did. She 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 was looking great. I could see these improvements in her. Um, she had some pain from some other issues, and she said, you know, the cannabis oil really is helping with the pain. But she didn't want her, her allopathic doctor, her MD, to know that she was taking this. So I accompanied her to every appointment and every scan that she had, And, um, you know, that tumor never grew and it never spread, not even a little bit. It shrunk a little bit, but it didn't actually disappear. And at one point, her doctor, who had put her on palliative, um, classified her as palliative, um, he said, you know, he said, I think I'm going to have to take you off of palliative. I don't think you are palliative. And, you know, that that was very encouraging. But she agreed with the family that she would take the 60 um, the sixty grams in 90 days, and she did that faithfully. She also really did not um, like how she felt when she was taking the medicine. But once that period of time was up, she just said, you know, I kept my promise, and, and that's all I'm going to do. I don't want to, to do any more of the oil. So we had to respect her wishes because it was her choice. Um, she didn't have a lot of faith in it. I think my mom just decided, I didn't understand this until later, but I think she just decided it was her time to go as well. What happened was she stopped taking the oil, um, and she started taking a lot of pain medication, and eventually she didn't have an appetite, and she stopped eating and drinking. So that was also a very, very tragic, difficult kind of end. Jerry, um, how old was your mom when she died? She was 77. It's interesting the comment you made, or other people have made, about her appearance once she started taking the cannabis oil, that she looked uh, yeah. she looked radiant, I guess. It's wonderful. She did. Her eyes cleared up and got brighter. Her skin looked better. She, she looked. Um, she had lupus. She had Graves' disease, thyroid problems, and... Um, she had fibromyalgia, and with you know some reading that I've been doing since then, some uh, I've I've come to understand that sometimes people can have a cannabinoid deficiency. I've often wondered, you know, if that was the case with my mom because it really it really was quite dramatic how much better she looked and and how much better she felt, although she didn't like the high part of the oil, you know. She wasn't very happy if, if she was feeling high. But other than that, she she really was doing well. Jerry, did your mom um, do all of the oil orally or did she do some via suppository? She only did suppositories. We had little syringes and I would mix it up and she would take like half a gram mixed with half a gram of coconut oil to make one mil in the morning and then she'd do another one at night. Interesting. Um so the stat times she was fine and times it was really psychoactive with her i think it that happens with people depending on you know how deep it is it, yeah exactly that's what i was going to get into is uh, because the stats are something like 90 percent of people don't get high and i know i've talked to thousands upon thousands and i've only ever once talked to one person who got high that way but my understanding is yeah. that if you go up too far with it then it gets picked up uh, by the vagus nerve or something and then it pulls it through the liver or something and you do get high but uh, as long as you just put it in just past the sphincter muscle, you're, you're generally good to go without the psychotropic effects. That's what I've heard, too. And you know, Corey, I mean, look at what people go through with chemotherapy. Exactly. I mean, you know. Yes. And it's, radiation. It's brutal. It's very yes. brutal. Very and, brutal. And, and with my mom, um, she decided to take a little bit of radiation and, you know, I did tell her that I didn't think that was a very good idea. But once again, a big lesson for me was respecting other people's right to choose for themselves. 
which I do really, you know, I think that's very important. Um, and she did go ahead and have six sessions of radiation. But, you know, it was like night and day that knocked the stuffing right out of her. She lost 30 pounds in the next two or three weeks. She could hardly walk. She was exhausted. Um, she ended up getting very, very sick. Um, she had this problem with thrush in her mouth. She was just miserable. And, you know, it was about a month or two after that when she finally admitted to me, she says, you know, I think I had radiation poisoning. But she was so determined to take it and so insistent that it wasn't going to hurt her. Um, you know, so that was quite a lesson to see. Your mother dies of cancer. Yes. Your husband dies of cancer. And yes. when were you diagnosed with cancer? I was diagnosed a month before my mom passed away. So it was in August of 2015. And that was just as my mom, you know, she was just at the end of her journey there for that next month. So what was and your, what, sorry, what was your official diagnosis? My official diagnosis was invasive ductal carcinoma. Estrogen, progesterone positive, I think 90 or 100 percent. I was on hormone replacement therapy, and I was also HER2 positive, which apparently makes it quite aggressive. Yes. Immediately, when I was diagnosed, um, you see, when I was around 50, I was having severe menopausal symptoms, and I'd hoped to go on bioidenticals, but my doctor... He, he vigorously opposed that and, um, you know, insisted if I was going to do anything, I should go on hormone replacement therapy. And, and so, of course, I said, well, doesn't that cause breast cancer? And he said, oh, no, they've done more studies. Those original findings were false and they're finding it doesn't really increase your risk that much. And I thought, oh, well, okay. And I, I was just tired of arguing with them, and I finally just agreed to go on the hormone replacement therapy. Well, once I was on that, it was so difficult to get off of it. Even if I missed one um, dose in a day, I started to climb the walls. Um, so e even though I repeatedly tried to get off of it, I wasn't successful. But when I was diagnosed with the hormone-driven breast cancer, I said, okay, that's it. I'm going off cold turkey. So on top of everything else that I was going through, I was, you know, coming off of uh, HRT, which really added a, a whole extra layer of fun. That was in August. So my mom passed away in September, and then my, um, my husband and I went for our, our scans together in, in December. And then he passed away just last January. What was it like for you getting off hormone replacement therapy cold turkey? Oh, it was hell. It was really awful. Um, you know, that combined with all the other stressors that were in my life, you know, it was really quite a nightmare. I have a theory, too, about pharmaceuticals. Uh, the only pharmaceuticals I've taken regularly have been hormone replacement therapy and antidepressants. And, you know, we're all aware of what's going on right now with the opiate addiction, um, the pain-killing drugs, the fentanyl. And um, I just think it's, it's a terrible thing that these drugs are so highly addictive because once you're on them, it isn't easy to get, get off. And I, I wonder sometimes, you know, if they need to be as addictive as they are. So what did you do when you were diagnosed with breast cancer? I was really shocked um, because I, I had, the year before, I'd had a full physical and all of my tests came back excellent. I've always, you know, been very mindful of what I eat. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Um, I've always had, you know, good health. Um, I haven't been a sick kind of person. So when I was diagnosed with the cancer, I was, um, I was shocked to, to start with, and then I was absolutely terrified. So right away, I had to go to the cancer clinic and talk to the chemotherapist and the radiologist. I had an appointment with a surgeon. Um, but because I had done so much research with my, for my mom, and because I had seen every scan that she had, that gave me the fortitude 
to refuse the chemo and the radiation and the surgery, in fact, and at least give myself a chance. I, I just took it a day at a time. Um, I booked my first surgery, saw the surgeon. They were willing to give me a double mastectomy um, with reconstruction and, and all of all of all of. What I did was I booked a surgery, but then I would cancel it and say that I was in too much grief to go through that. And it was actually that was true, um, but more truthfully, I was buying time to see if this little lump disappeared. So I had two different surgeons, uh, three surgeries booked, and um, I just kept taking the oil and doing my research. I'd started juicing, you know, doing all the dietary changes and um, praying. <laughs> I, I really did learn to pray and, and look deep within to, to find the answers to this whole dilemma I was facing. So ultimately, well, I'll tell you one little story. When I was waiting to see the chemotherapist at the cancer clinic, and remember I'd already been there with my husband and my mother that year. I'd been down for all these appointments with both of them. I was talking to a lady while I was waiting. She was sitting beside me in the waiting room before I went in to speak with the chemotherapist. And, and you know, so we were chatting, and she, she shared with me that she had had six different surgeries, um, she was here for an, another round of chemotherapy. She told me, you know, a lot of, of the different experiences she had gone through. And so what I learned that, I learned that her previous 10 years had basically, her whole life had been about surgeries, cancer, chemotherapy, recovering, infections, um, all of those things. And I thought to myself, you know, that just isn't going to be me. That's not what I want for my life. That's not living. After hearing from the radiologist and the chemotherapist what my options were, and basically I could have a, um, a partial mastectomy with 26 rounds of radiation, and then the chemo I didn't even get specific about because I wouldn't let them do a, a sentinel node biopsy. I never did allow that. But after I learned what my options were, I basically decided that I was, um, if this was my time to go, you know, I was willing to, to, to die. I would rather have a healthy life with cannabis oil and a good diet and all of the faculties that I have. Even if my life was shorter, that was preferable to going down the route of, you know, surgery, chemo, radiation, reconstruction, Hericept every day, um, tamoxifen every day, and all that that would mean to the, my quality of life. So when it came right down to it, deep down inside, that was my final decision. And it still is. That's how I will live my life. Do the medical authorities pressure you at all to undergo treatment? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) 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 I would say so, yes. In fact, I describe it as psychological terrorism. Um, I was told that I had a death wish. I was told that... Um, I would only live for another year. Maybe, like, I'm sorry to interrupt, but maybe you talked to the same guy I did at the cancer clinic, because <laughs> those are the exact words he used. told me I had yeah. a death wish, except the time difference was two to four months in my case. But <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, just their whole attitude. There was one surgeon who said, well, do you have any swollen lymph nodes? This was a woman in Victoria. And I said, no, I don't. And she jammed her arm. It felt like her whole arm up my armpit. And she says, I think I can feel one in there. Oh, no. You know, and um, my own medical doctor, he, he was so insistent that I have this sentinel node biopsy. I said, why would I do that and put myself at risk for lifetime lymphedema when I don't even have a swollen lymph node? You know, like yeah. we have lymph nodes for a reason. And um, they were all very, very insistent. At no time did I receive a shred of acknowledgement, even after my scans came back and the tumor had shrunk and um, it was successful. There was not one word of acknowledgement um, that I had saved my life that way. Not one. 
there's only doom and gloom and dire predictions. And uh, that was, you know, sadly lacking. Your story reminds me uh, very much of the story we talked to a woman in Washington State who was diagnosed with uh, cancer. And yeah. she lived 15 minutes from her doctors, and by the time she got home, she had five calls encouraging her to undergo chemo and radiation. And they kept calling her, and, and matter of fact, they even sent her a registered letter. And so the pressure is really on people. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. And how they justify that is they, they say, basically, you're going to die without this treatment. And, you know, that just simply isn't the truth in all cases. I mean, every individual is unique and every case is different. I don't believe that people are told the truth about these treatments. And I don't believe they're told the truth about different options. And that's a crime. It's not right. How are you today, Jerry? I feel fantastic. Um, I really do believe that I'm healthier um, than I've ever been. I, I'm much better nourished because of my dietary changes and all the superfoods that I eat. Um, I'm much more rested. I get lots of sleep. Um, I get more exercise. My whole, whole lifestyle has changed, really. I'm not working full-time anymore either. So that's made a big difference. How much oil were you taking or are you taking today? Well, for about 10 months, I pretty faithfully took a gram of high THC um, cannabis oil a day. And it, if I was to do it over again, I would be sure to get a one-to-one -one strain. I think the one-to-one -one strain is better than the... the um, the super high THC strain. At least I would be willing to try that because I also did have quite uh, quite a bit of anxiety. The, the psychological effects of the high THC weren't always easy for me. Yeah, and you know, there's. I'm sure you're well aware there's uh, all this discussion around right now about what is best when it comes to yeah. hormone-driven breast cancers uh, because they're... Uh, pardon my French, bitch to deal with. They truly are. And I really yeah. do feel it takes a holistic approach that you've done. Um, we had a, spoke to another woman, uh, Paula Doyle in uh, Alberta, who had the same type of cancer. And oh, I know who Paula is. She's lovely. And, she? and uh, she, she, again, was somebody who went at this with, a, with an entire approach, you know, uh, diet, yeah. emotional, the cannabis yeah. oil as well. But certainly, you know, as I started to say, with um, hormone-driven breast cancers, there's some indication that THC can push it. And um, so now there's uh, the big discussion, should it be two-to-one CBD, THC, should it be one-to-one? -one? And I know when I was in Prague, um, I brought up this very subject as often as I could with different people in the know. And certainly what came out of that was at least a one-to-one, -one, if not two-to-one ratio. Mm -hmm. Although, look at you and how successful, yeah. you, successful you've been with the high THC. So, again, exactly. everybody is different. Exactly. And I was really resistant to the idea of more CBD, less THC, because in, in my mind, I really think the THC is the super killer cancer. It is. Cancer killer. And, and I was really concerned that women were starting to take too much CBD and not enough THC, and that was putting their lives at risk. So my own personal approach is I make sure I get lots of THC, and lots of CBD. CBD, yeah. You know, since CBD's become the new kid on the block, which is about the last three years, I cannot tell you how many people with different cancers have taken CBD and not THC, and we've lost them, right? Because they find out right at the end, no, wait a moment, you need high THC. And I yeah. definitely think that even with these hormone-driven breast cancers, you still have to have that high THC component yeah. there. I totally agree with you, Corey. And, you know, I'm in a lot of different groups on Facebook. You know, there's lots of these wonderful, wonderful supportive groups, and yours is one of them this raging controversy and people get really 
you know, really excited about it. Yes. But I still maintain the same as you do. The high THC is really, really important. I would take the CBD to offset some of the anxiety with the THC. Yes. And I CBD does a lot of good. You know, we don't even know all the wonderful things these cannabinoids do for us. But don't um, don't drop the amount of THC too much. Yeah, yeah, that's my feeling too. Yeah. Lady, ladies, can I ask you a, a stupid man's question? What's the difference between um, hormone-driven breast cancer and other forms of breast cancer? Well, I don't think that's a stupid man question. I uh, When I first heard of hormone-driven breast cancers... I thought to myself, well, I would think that all breast cancers would be Mm -hmm. hormone-driven. Jerry, you're probably able to answer that even better than I am, but I think it's something to do with, um, okay, so, for example, I've had a lot of success with triple negative breast cancer, where you don't have that estrogen component there or the progesterone component. And that's apparently more genetic, I think. I don't know as much about the triple negative. I know that um, there's lots of different cancers can be hormone driven. For example, prostate cancer is also hormone driven, or, yeah. or their uterine cancer. And this was the reason that I didn't follow along with the CBD argument because when I was struggling with this controversy myself, and there was a time where I was quite worried that I wasn't getting enough CBDs. You see, we don't hear about prostate cancer getting worse with high THC or ovarian or any of the other ones. Mm -hmm. And so I started to kind of be a little bit suspicious because there's been so many lies (laughs) that I've uncovered about health and treatment. I was thinking, you know, why are people saying that THC drives hormone-driven cancers? And and from what I could see with Rick Simpson, he would have noticed this at some point with ovarian, uterine, breast. Lots of cancers are hormone driven. But you see, when I was when I I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I said to my doctor, I said, "What are the st- statistics? How often are women diagnosed with breast cancer?" So he told me one in ten. I went home, I went online, and it said one in nine. Okay, this was in 2015. Mm -hmm. Now, this last Pinktober Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the new statistic is one in seven women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. That's a lot of women. That is a lot of women. A lot of women. And if, you know, the concern I had was, is this controversy somehow being fueled um, to create doubt so that more women don't trust cannabis and go to traditional treatment. I mean, that's my suspicious mind. I still believe in my own heart that, that the high THC is needed for all cancers. And I also believe that cannabis never harms, it always heals. I, I trust my body to work out the ratios. I just yeah. make sure I give it enough raw material and, you know, the the healing mechanism in the body is wise enough to sort it out. I think um, definitely high THC. I know when before this whole CBD craze, we suggested people treat themselves with high THC, whether regardless of whether it was uh, a hormone-driven breast cancer or not. And yeah. we had successes with hormone-driven breast cancer. Then there's the been the whole CBD publicity thing, and particularly with the hormone-driven breast cancers. Yeah. And I can say that I know of probably at least 50 women who were on high CBD from cannabis, derived from cannabis, and yeah. high CBD was not successful in any of these cases, not one. Wow. You know, and I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I'm just saying that's my experience, what I've observed. And I truly, truly think you need that ITHC in, in conjunction with the CBD. I agree with you, Corey. And it's not like an either or. It's get lots of THC, and you know, it's not going to hurt you. Take lots of CBD too. Mm-hmm. It isn't going to hurt you. No. Did you make your own oil? I surely did. Good for you. Now, so did you make it from one strain? Or a combination? No, I try to make it from um, as many different strains as I can because I think that gives you a broader spectrum of all the different cannabinoids. Yeah, that's my my, uh, feeling as well. 
Jerry, are you cancer free today? Well, I'm going for another ultrasound soon. Um, but as far as I know, I had a, a full physical three weeks ago and I was declared healthy with, you know, no disease detected. The last scan that I had was in June. Um, and it said may just be a supergiated duct. Now, most, see, I've learned a little bit about, about breast cancer. 75% of it is ductal carcinoma. Maybe 85%. Only 15% of it's lobular. So what I had thought was kind of a really small case of cancer in myself is actually quite typical. You know, I, I was fairly typical kind of case. Yeah, so I'm, I, but I, of course, I, I give myself, um, you know, exams and I certainly can't detect anything. I was the one who found the lump in the first place. So uh, when I went back to the doctor and I told him the lump was gone, he said to me, Jerry, he said, I'll sing hallelujah and declare you a medical miracle if that lump's gone. Well, I still haven't heard the song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to come along for the performance. <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't find the lump, and awesome. neither can I, and neither can any, you know, another doctor who checked. So I think, you know, at some point we have to use some common sense. Like I said to him when when he insisted I have the sentinel node biopsy where they go in and they squirt dye in and they take your lymph nodes out. The whole purpose of that is to examine the lymph nodes to see if there's any cancer and then they can determine what kind of chemotherapy they're going to give you. I said to my doctor, I'm never having chemo. I'm never having radiation. Why would I allow you to take my lymph node out? There's no point. And besides that, there's none of them are swollen. I think that we're just going to hold off <laughs> on on uh, that procedure. Jerry, it was wonderful to talk to you. You've been through a lot, but uh, you're healthy, and uh, that's the main thing. It was great of you to join us. Thank you very much. You're so welcome, Ian and Corey. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. We, we really, really appreciate it. That's it for another edition of Cannabis Health Radio. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.